What a year it's been, brothers and sisters, as our two earlier speakers have been portraying. Who would have thought this time last year the situation will be so changed in this country that we now have a strong government and a man determined to separate Britain from the clutches of the EU. An absolutely amazing transformation in just a matter of 12 months. But the word of God is true. And in spite of the troubles that we saw in the past three years, as Britain sought to separate herself from the EU, Bible students were confident that the day would come when Britain would leave. And in spite of all the problems, we had to trust the word of God. This is truth. This is what comes to pass. Because God is in control. The nations are but putty in his hands as he guides them through the angels to take a pathway which they don't want to take. But God's will is eventually done. And we've seen such surprising results, haven't we? The surprise to the pollsters of the 2016 um, uh, referendum results, but Bible students knew that if Britain had gone into the EU, it had to come out again, and so we rejoiced at what we saw. Uh, and again, with the uh, elections in December, you know, the pollsters didn't foresee that there would be a majority for Johnson, uh, and yet that is what is necessary in order that God's plan and purpose should move forward. Uh, and both our earlier speakers have painted this picture that Britain doesn't have a part in Europe in the latter days. In the last scenario, Britain is isolated from the EU on opposing sides, as Brother Ken has so easily and well uh, shown us. Britain has a destiny which she is not aware of, but in God's hands that destiny will come to pass. And so, Brother Thomas, writing 170 years ago, saw that in the final analysis, Britain would not be under, or would not be part of Europe, would not be counted among the ten toes on the feet of the image. But when in 1973 Britain did join the EU, many of us were disappointed because we knew that that meant that the coming of the Lord Jesus was going to be some way off. Because if Britain had joined, then there had to be a change of circumstances that brought about her separation from the EU. And my father, in the first issue of Milestones uh, in 1977, so writing that came out at the, end of, uh, at the beginning of 1998, he says, it is clear that there must be a change, of course, for Britain. There must be a spiritual revival and a separation from Europe. When and how is not clear. And what ominous but spot-on words he added, there will be no easy release. So he saw that it would be a struggle. And in the next edition, he said, long-term Britain must return to her maritime Tyrian Tarshish position to fulfill her role of doing homage to the king and carrying out the task of bringing the Jews back to their land that Brother Ken has been looking at. In 1981, we move on a few years. Though we don't know how it will happen, Britain will separate from Europe. And in 1989, he wrote... It should be obvious that Britain, biblically, has no place in Europe when Christ comes. And Brother Paul Billington, in writing in 1990, in his booklet, Guardians of Israel and Arabia, said she, Britain, must therefore perforce not part of the European system when these prophecies are finally fulfilled. Britain's eventual exit from Europe is a certainty. And my father fell asleep in 1994, anticipating that one day Britain would come out, but he didn't live to see it. And time rolls on. And so 
I wrote in 2000 that Milestones has consistently spoken of the need for Britain to leave the EU. Another 10 years on, we're looking for Britain to play a leading role in world affairs. We anticipate Britain's role to be played outside the EU. In 2015, Britain is straining at the lead to be free of the enmeshing regulations of the EU. Greater powers are in operation, ensuring that she sails away from the coasts of Europe and ventures once again on the oceans of the world. And now, brothers and sisters, that's history. That's happened. Britain has taken that step. She has separated from Europe. She is carving out her own destination. And this is another stone that we can add to the building blocks, the stepping stones to the kingdom of God. We've seen many remarkable signs, or our brotherhood has seen many remarkable signs. Uh, Jerusalem freed from the Turkish rule, which again we looked at earlier in 1917. The state of Israel in 1948. The Jerusalem being taken by the Jews in 67, Russia coming down into Syria in 2015, and now we can add this other stone, 2020, Brexit. So my father would be absolutely thrilled to have seen what we have seen. And we as a brotherhood should be much more enthusiastic for the things of the truth because we are so near to the coming of the Lord Jesus. The Bible's coming alive before our eyes. It doesn't matter how young we are, unless there's a very, very, very small baby in the crash, in the lifetime of everybody here, Brexit has become a reality. And how the tables have turned. This is a cartoon from 2017, when the Brexit talks were about to start. And uh, the British negotiators were very much in a a terrible mess, really. They weren't prepared. They they thought it was going to be a simple task to leave the EU. But the EU had their own plans. They were going to enmesh Britain so she couldn't leave. Uh, And that was a cartoon which we showed uh, three years ago. Uh, And how the situation has now changed. It's the EU who's in disarray. And Boris there is saying, when you're ready, Monsieur Barnier, uh, let's get going. So, a a wonderful change. So, it was said at the time of the election, this is uh, Geostrategy Direct, an American uh, news magazine, that the UK Brexit vote has far-reaching geostrategic ramifications Uh, uh, and that's what we've been seeing brother ken has taken us through the changes that have got to be britain has this wonderful role in the middle east among israel among the southern arab nations uh, and she's got to build her strength up and build her forces up so that she can play that role and for years britain has struggled as a member of the eu who's so against israel She has struggled to uh, establish herself as a strong power in the Middle East. Now with Brexit, that's a a much easier task. And although the British people in the referendum in 2016 have said they want to leave, albeit by a small margin, and the powers that be, the majority of the members of parliament were so enmeshed with the EU and the gravy chain that it really is for them, they wouldn't let Britain go. And the British people, their characteristic is they're very patient people. They're prepared to stand in queues and be very patient. But eventually, that spirit gives way. And in December, they have their opportunity. With a stroke of a pen, they put their cross in the box to say, that they wanted a party who would take them out of the EU and give them back their sovereignty. And brothers and sisters, when we woke up on the morning of the day after the voting, then the powers that be that were in opposition to Brexit had been swept away. 
And we can see the parallel with what happened to uh, Israel in the time of Hezekiah. The armies of the Assyrians were threatening Jerusalem. But suddenly, overnight, that power was thrown away. They were all dead men. A similar situation has arisen. And those that stood for Brexit have been swept out of power. Oh, sorry, those that were uh, wanted to remain have been swept out of power. Uh, and the Brexit people are now in a strong position to reinforce what we know from Bible has to be the case. Britain, completely independent of Europe, plowing her own course in the Middle East. Uh, and dramatically overnight, the Red maps, red areas of the Labour Party were washed away from the map of Britain. And it was an outstanding victory, wasn't it? 80 seat majority. And the papers celebrated. It was a time of rejoicing. The people's voice had now been listened to. They had a champion in Boris. The lion could roar. And there was a lovely cartoon which came across in August of last year, an American magazine. It was uh, the illustration to a wonderful article which explained why Britain couldn't get out of the EU. It was enmeshed, and there were bars on the cage. Now, you won't be able to read the small writing on there, so let's enlarge it. But these were the forces that were preventing Brexit. Papers like The Guardian, who were very opposed to the uh, Britain leaving, Theresa May, the BBC, Angela Merkel, the House of Lords, Ireland, Tony Blair, Brussels, David Cameron, France. These were the bars. But the power of those bars was broken in December. Uh, and the lion was able to escape from the cage of the EU. So we have to ask ourselves, why did Britain go into the EU? Why on the 1st of December in 1993 did Britain, along with two other, mem other countries, join the much smaller EU, the total of 12 members when Britain, as Britain joined? Edward Heath, who was the British Prime Minister, deceived the people of this country. He knew as papers after 30 years have revealed, uh, that he understood the Europeans told him what the purpose of the EU was. It was political union. He knew that he couldn't sell that to the British people. So it was agreed that they wouldn't talk about that. They would sell the uh, EEC, as the EU was known then, as a common market, a place to trade. And that, of course, appealed to the British people who were a trading nation. So it was deceit that took Britain in. And it was at a time when Britain did feel very low. She was still struggling after the cost of World War II. But in hindsight, brothers and sisters, in hindsight, I must admit, is a wonderful thing. But we know that in hindsight, it was necessary for Britain to join the EU for one purpose only, and that was to hold Britain, hold Europe back from its purpose of becoming this super state, which we know it will be. The time hadn't yet come. The fact that Britain now is leaving indicates to us that the time has come. Europe is going to build itself together as a super state rebuild the German Reich again, uh, and to be a power in Europe with the church at its side. So the time wasn't right then. Britain had a role to play. She played that role very well. They always despised Britain because she held them back from doing what they wanted to do. And so, overnight, with a powerful government in control, Boris was able to get his second reading through with a majority of 124 votes and the, just before Christmas. And then on the 9th, the third reading went through with a majority of 99. Then went to the House of Lords, came back from the House of Lords, and on the 
23rd of January, the withdrawal agreement received royal assent. And you can see in the picture, as Boris comes back from getting the Queen's signature on this, that smile on his face. He had achieved what everybody says was impossible. And he was able to add his own signature to that. And then just a month ago, we witnessed the 31st of January, 2020, coming to pass, Brexit Day. And at 11 o'clock, which of course is midnight at Brussels, we still were under Brussels control, so it's midnight, not in Britain, but midnight in Brussels. The, the stroke of 11 o'clock in the evening, Britain left. And in Brussels, the Union Jack was taken down to be put away. Britain was no longer a member. There were no longer 28 members, but 27. And the British Lion could awake out of its sleep. Yes, the lion looks a bit tired and a bit saggy and lost a lot of its strength, but it will come back. The new spirit will invade Britain and she will stand up proud. And it was time for celebration. This was the fourth Brexit date. And this 50p coin had been minted and had to be scrapped on several occasions. But now the time had come for this coin to be minted. And if you haven't got one, I've still got some on the milestone stand. This is an important milestone in our anticipation of the Tarshish work for Britain. Because what does it say? Peace and prosperity and friendship with all nations. And we're not going to argue about the Oxford comma, um, but that's, that's nothing to do with it. But that's exactly what we've been looking for. I nearly had Isaiah 23 read, but we've looked at it before, and we're not going to look at it again. But Isaiah 23 paints this wonderful picture of Tarshish in the latter days, and it speaks of her turning to her higher, committing fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And that's what this coin is talking about. Peace and friendship with all nations. We're seeing you can hold a bit of scripture in your hands, brothers and sisters and young people. These are exciting times to be living. And the press were exultant. Rise and shine, it's a glorious new Britain. A new dawn for Britain. And we can see now how the EU has been uh, put on the back foot. Suddenly they're facing a big hole in their budget because Britain is one of the top contributors. And here is Britain saying, we want to be out and we want to be out fast because every month we're in, we're paying a million, a billion dollars, a billion euros into your funds, and we want to be out. We don't want to contribute to you. And, and so what is now about to commence on Monday, March the 2nd, are, are the talks between Britain and the EU negotiators as to what deal Britain is going to have. How is she going to trade with the EU in the future? Uh, and Johnson has indicated his fury at the EU because... They're, they're changing the goalposts, as it were. Uh, and these are just some of the headlines. Uh, won't accept EU rules as a price of a deal. He wants to be a free trade grandmaster. Uh, we'll walk away, Chief Negotiator David Frost tells the EU. Uh, and just on Thursday, we will not agree to any obligations for our laws to be aligned with the EU's or for the EU institutions, including the Court of Justice, to have any jurisdiction in the UK. Now, this is the great divide between Mrs May, who wanted to have both feet in Europe, but somehow be separate, and the position we're now in under Johnson. This is a complete break from the EU. That's the only way, as Brother Ken says, for Britain to regain her independence, to be completely separate. And again, on 
Thursday, um, it, it was uh, Michael Gove uh, said that we're ready to leave in June. If the talks aren't making any progress, then when we get to June, we'll give up on talks and we'll say, right, we're going to leave in December on World Trade terms, uh, and then we've got to sort out how we're going to do that. We'll concentrate on that. See, for the Europeans, that, that they thought they had Britain enmeshed. And suddenly those meshes, those chains, those nets have been broken. The bars have gone. Uh, and uh, the terminology was they're fighting like ferrets in a bag. That was when they met together to see how they're going to fill the big hole in their budget uh, and nobody wants to pay more money in, but they want to uh, build and expand. Uh, but who's going to pay for it? There's a lot of divisions. Uh, and they want Britain's fish. Uh, and this uh, headline in the Telegraph, Brussels is fatally complacent about the crisis about to engulf it. Brussels is already moving the goalposts. And uh, as the Times put it, we will walk away. We're not going to count out to the EU. We've got the strength, the mind and purpose and backing now to walk away. Uh, and he gave a very, this was from a talk that he gave in Brussels at the University of Libra. We believe sovereignty is meaningful and what it enables us to do is to set our rules for our own benefit. I think, looking forward, we're going to have a huge advantage over the EU. And this is him telling the EU what Britain's negotiating stance was. The ability to set regulations for new sectors, the new ideas and new conditions quicker than the EU can, and based on sound science, not fear of the future. I have no doubt that we will be able to encourage new investments and new ideas in this way, particularly given our plans to boost spend on scientific research, attract scientists, and make Britain the best country in the world to do science. So it's a very forthright speech. As he set out, we're going to be different. We're not the same as you. We're going to be different. You see, the goalposts, are being steadily widened. Spain insists that Gibraltar is brought into the talks because Spain wants to have control over Gibraltar. And Greece wants the Elgin marble, so that, that's been drawn into the talks. And France wants unfettered access to the UK fish. And Germany is insistent on a level playing field. And the EU says you must follow EU rules after Brexit. Britain's not interested. She's going to turn her back on the EU. And this was from the editorial a fortnight ago in the Daily Telegraph. Has the EU misunderstood the British position? Mr. Frost's lecture should leave it in no doubt about the seriousness of the government's intent to reclaim our independence. It should offer the UK a fair deal or prepare for us to walk away. And if Britain walks away, then the bill that the EU says that Britain owes, the £39 billion um, pounds, uh, won't get paid. There'll be an even bigger deficit for the EU. So, why are we so excited at Britain's exit from the EU? Well, as Brother Ken has looked at many of these points, uh, and I love the point that he made, that both Britain and Europe have got to be humbled. Britain, to be like Tarshish of old, to be a friend of Israel and help Solomon build a temple, so Britain will help uh, in the temple rebuilding and bringing the Jews back. But Europe is humbled, but to be put away. It's the sheep and goats that Jesus talked about. When we correctly understand that chapter in Matthew, this is what he's talking about. There will be nations who will be blessed, there will be nations who will be rejected, and rejected will 
be exterminated. If they do not accept the rule of Christ, and we know that Europe won't, then there's only one fate for them. The only people allowed to live in the kingdom of God when Jesus is king are those nations who have agreed that they accept the Lord Jesus as Israel's king, as their king. So I want to pick up, and uh, yes, all three of us are, are going to the same place because this, these are one of the key passages. So uh, we took a reading from Daniel chapter 2. There's no need for me to explain any of this because uh, we've looked at it. But I just want to make this emphasis that this image represents the kingdom of man in opposition to God's kingdom. It all revolves, Daniel chapter 2 and the image, all revolves around God's nation of Israel. As that first verse that we read, it's what shall be in the latter days, and we're in those latter days. And each of the metal powers were opposed to, or bear rule, um, some were more friendly than others, but they bear rule over Israel. And we know for 1,900 years, Israel has ceased to exist as a nation until my lifetime. Too young to really remember it, but when I was four, 1948, the state of Israel was set up. And that means that then Daniel's image can come to life again, because if it's to do with the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel has to be there, as Brother Ken told us. And so we can look at the image and the fulfillment of the legs in different ways. Um, and I would just give a, another slant to it, and not in opposition, but in uh, reinforcement of what has gone before. That the iron of Rome continued in the churches and in the systems of Russia. When Constantinople fell, it was Russia that took over. Uh, and when Rome fell, then it was the Roman Catholic Church and the uh, Holy Roman Empire that continued. Uh, and both those extensions of the legs, as it were, run us through to World War I. And then we know the importance of World War I because that was when Britain gained control of the Middle East, took Jerusalem, allowed Israel eventually to become a nation. So on the eastern leg, again, very similar to Britain joining the EEC, the communists took over after World War I and held back any development of a Russian uh, czar-like leader and working with a church. The church was suppressed. And that held sway until 1991. That was swept away. And since 1991, then we've seen, witnessed in uh, Russia, this Putin as a leader who models himself upon uh, Tsar Peter the Great and the rebirth of the Russian Orthodox Church and church and state working together. So we can see the development of, of the foot of the eastern leg. And what we're about to witness is a similar situation on the west. Britain has been the power that's held back until Israel is established as a nation, has now grown strong, and is arousing the hostility of the nation, so they want to do away with her. Now Britain comes out, Europe will come together to be the Western foot. And we shall see not only the coming political coming together of Western Europe, but we shall also see it working more strongly with the Vatican. Religion is going to play a strong part. False religion in both feet because they are opposed to God's people, the true kingdom of God. So we have this situation that once again the nations are preparing to take control of Israel. But the Bible has told us what their fate will be. Uh, and we read of that, didn't we, in the chapter I'm not going to go through it, time is running on, but we know how it's all going to be broken together. All the metals are present. They're all going to be ground up by the little stone power. 
And brothers and sisters, that's our hope, isn't it? To be with the Lord Jesus in that day, to be part of that stone power which will establish truth and righteousness upon the earth. It's not a pleasant thing, but this is the only way that the nations will be brought to recognize the Lord Jesus as their king through mighty power being shown and displayed. And so I jumped straight to the map of showing the amalgam that uh, Brother Pete and Brother Ken have talked about, the nations coming together. Uh, and again, I'll uh, we'll just very quickly go through this because uh, the ground has already been covered, but we have these two groups. Those on the side of Gog who are opposed to Israel uh, and Gog's opponents who are friendly with Israel and supporting Israel. Uh, and when we just very quickly uh, put them on the map, these places which are listed in these chapters, we can see that it is uh, Tagama. Uh, it is uh, a remarkable picture because there are two, three big areas which are excluded. They're excluded because they belong to the opposing side. India, Saudi Arabia and Britain are not part of that amalgam. Uh, and we know that they are destined, Gog is destined to come down to destroy Israel. She will cease from being a nation, as will Egypt. And at that time, there will be terrible state for the world and for Israel in particular. When the forces of this world have come together under the direction of the papacy to get rid of the Jews and what they stand for and to establish their own rule, the Christianity, false Christianity, as a center in Jerusalem, no longer under Jewish control. And that's when this image is formed in its finality, when it has feet which he can stand upon and come down against the land of Israel. Now, I just want to change the symbolism because, as we've already been told, what is portrayed here is the same as is in the New Testament, but using different symbols. Um, but we can trace the linkage between the symbols, but not time to do that. But in the latter time, when the Battle of Armageddon takes place, we have a beast, we have a dragon, and we have a false prophet. And the situation changes after Armageddon because the dragon power is eliminated. But this is before the picture, before Armageddon. Now, the beast doesn't look much of a beast, does it? It looks like a lamb. But appearances are very deceptive. We're told that it deceives those that dwell on the earth and it speaks blasphemy against God. This political power, which is not just a political power, because it has two horns. And a horn represents the strength of the, the particular beast, as it were. And the two horns echo from the past, represent an emperor uh, and a pope working together to hold Europe together, the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't holy, but it was Roman, and it was an empire. And it speaks as a dragon, we're told in Revelation chapter 13. So it speaks like this dragon power. And Brother Peter has told us about its mastery at deception how it gets control through speaking peace and wonderful things. But its ultimate aim is to take control and to hold under its power. The beast is no different. It's modeled on the same animal, the dragon. It's modeled on the dragon. It, it speaks kind words and speaks peace and all these things. But at its heart, all it wants is power to have control. And so we see uh, great changes are about to come to pass. And just a fortnight ago, the high and the mighty of this world gathered together in Munich, in Germany, for their annual Munich 
Security Conference, where they discuss the affairs of the world and how they're going to face those particular problems that are apt up with time. Now, the theme this year was an unusual one. It's not a misprint. Westlessness. That was the theme of the Munich Conference in the 4th to the 16th of February. What does it mean by Westlessness? Since the end of the Second World War, the West has been one of the key players in world events. While not totally unified, the West includes the United States, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Western Europe, with Eastern Europe joining after the end of the Cold War. This bloc has held similar values, freedom, democracy, relatively free market economies, and is held together by a series of overlapping alliances like NATO and the European Union. It is clear the West is no more. There are two power blocks. A German-dominated Europe on the one side and the United States, Britain, Canada and Australia and New Zealand on the other. And this is why they had come together. Europe is splitting from America and Britain is splitting from Europe. And so there is this new dimension. There are new, two new power blocks an assembly of nations, Britain, America, and the Commonwealth countries on one side, and Europe and Russia on the other. Exactly what we've understood from Scripture to be the case. And Deutsche Welle, which is a German newspaper, commenting on what they were talking about at this conference, says, one thing is certain. There will be no return to the heyday of close transatlantic times. Rhetorically, at least, the Europeans have been shaken awake from that dream. There is much talk of Europe becoming a sovereign, strategic, political power. There are demands that Germany once again learns the language of power, which French President Emmanuel Macron has already seemed to master. It goes on, we need to... Uh, well, this is, this is what Macron said, uh, which Deutsche Welle is reporting... We need, says Macron, to develop our own strategy. We don't have the same geographic conditions as the US, not the same ideas about social equilibrium, about social welfare. There are ideals we have to defend. Mediterranean policy, that's a European thing, he said, not a transatlantic thing. And the same goes for Russia. We need a European policy, not just a transatlantic policy. In other words, he's saying, we're different from America. We're different from Britain. We've got to reorientate. We've got to think Mediterranean. We've got to think friendship with Russia. And we see this wonderful coming together, the two legs in cooperation together. And uh, the German defense minister, Angerit kramp um this is what she had to say at the conference. She completely agreed with Macron. We have joint instruments and joint interests. Let's finally create a joint political will. Let's get on and do it. We've been talking about a, a political Europe, a United States of Europe for years. Let's get on and do it. I want the effect of German and European security and defense policy to be greater, our actions to be better coordinated internationally and more clearly visible. They are now on a roll, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, to build the United States of Europe in opposition to uh, what America and Britain stand for. And as the leader of the EU, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, she, in her speech, as she was uh, put up as a candidate to be the uh, new commission president to take over from Juncker, she put together a, a, a mandate 
uh, of what her view of Europe was. Uh, and it was, she was quite clear, my aim is the United States of Europe. Uh, and she got the job. But this is, you can read the 24-page agenda, my agenda for Europe, uh, and these are some of the points, my further deepening of the economic and monetary union, further bold steps in the next five years towards a genuine European defence union. We need an integrated and comprehensive approach to our security to be a global leader, the EU must be able to act fast. I will push for qualified majority voting. The very thing that Britain refused to have. The qualified majority voting to become the rule in this area. So one state can't override their decisions. And she ended her uh, speech uh, putting herself forward as the candidate with this cry. Long live Europe! Now, the Gladstone Institute, an American paper, examining what her proposals were, have this to say. An examination of von der Leyen's main policy proposals reveals that she is calling for a massive expansion of top-down powers of the European Commission. Her proposals would substantially increase the role of Brussels in virtually all aspects of economic and social life in Europe, all at the expense of national sovereignty. That which Britain values national sovereignty, and she has left the EU because she wants sovereignty, von Leyen is determined that that's not going to happen to the EU. Brussels is going to increasingly take control of what is going on in the EU. My aim is the United States of Europe on the model of federal states such as Switzerland, Germany, or the United States. So not a loose confederation of members, but a, a, a like a United States of Europe. And so the rift is clear. This is from the economists back in uh, two years ago. So cleverly done. You can see uh, when Trump came to power, they so hate Trump in Europe that they use every excuse to be different and to separate. And we can see the hand of the angel. Trump was put there. He's a friend of Israel. He's a man that gets things done. He is causing this separation between Europe and uh, America, and he's bringing Britain, helping Britain to come out and to be separate uh, and to work with America and the other young lions. It's been a long, slow process, but I expect very rapid progress in the next few years. But the beast is but one aspect. The other aspect is the false prophet. Now, this is an interesting symbol. It only comes in Revelation 16. It's not a symbol that occurs earlier. Uh, and it is appropriate to our time period because the earlier symbol of an image of a beast to describe the papacy with its lands that it held in uh, Italy all came to an end as a result of uh, the French Revolution and its aftermath. The vile judgments in Revelation chapter 16, the first uh, six vials, uh, first, first uh, five vials were poured out uh, and destroyed the old system for the papacy. But it was just in 1880 when she lost all her lands and the Pope was a prisoner that the papacy declared this dogma of infallibility, that when the Pope sat on St. Peter's throne, then his words were the words of God, and they were infallible. Hence the description of false prophets. Because the prophets, the true prophets, spoke the words of God. And we know in the Old Testament times and in New Testament times, there were false prophets who claimed to speak the word of God, but were speaking out of their own hearts. And here is a system that the Bible tells us is a system that isn't uh, for God, it's against God. In fact, we're told it's full of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of the Lord Jesus. Here is a system that claims to be God's representative, but is a false prophet. 
So we've got a long way to go to see the same situation in the West as we see in the East of church and state working hand in hand, but it will come. Uh, and if this Pope remains on the throne, it will come very quickly. He, has, he is a Jesuit. Uh, they are very skillful. Uh, as I say, Brother Peter told us of the deception that is used by Putin, uh, and exactly the same method is used by the Vatican to deceive people of the true intent. And he's already reorganizing the Curia, that's the government of the Roman Catholic Church, putting in big changes. Uh, they're still being discussed at the moment, but uh, they're fairly imminent. But his, his main change has been to change the emphasis from doctrine, from insisting the church says you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do the other, because the church speaks for the God, uh, and uh, if it's in conflict with the word of God, it's because God's purpose has moved on and the church is speaking for God. So he's changing the emphasis from doctrine to this thought of evangelization. In other words, he's broadening the appeal of the Roman church from, uh, from a narrow set of doctrines to a much broader painting. Uh, and the Pope is taking to himself more powers from the Curia, uh, embedding it in the papacy. He's the final arbiter of what is going to happen. Uh, and what he's promoting is a global church, rather than one that's been centered in Europe, one that appeals to nations other than Christian nations uh, and nations outside Europe. Now we know that with the new set of leaders in the EU, uh, and men like Kurtz, the president of the, um, Austria, von Leyen, in the commissioner of the EU, uh, other major people, these are men and women who wear their Roman Catholicism on their hearts, and they're keen to promote the church as a, a part of Europe, not to be separate from Europe. The idea of keeping politics and church apart is now old hat. They're wanting to bring it together. And as uh, Brother Pete has told us, working with uh, Putin. Putin recognizes what an influence the Pope has. To have the Pope on side uh, and the Pope to have Putin to fulfill his will in defending the Christians who are being persecuted uh, and no doubt as part of the thing that brings Europe together will be a persecution of Christians in Israel, the one place where Christianity is safe. But uh, and when uh, the Elijah work takes place and there is a revival in Israel of the things of the Old Testament, then the Jews will realize that the churches and the mosques in Israel, these are idols in their midst. It's not difficult to see fanatical Jews taking action against some of the churches, against some of the mosques. And how quickly that would draw the nations to come to defend Christianity and Putin at the head of them and the Pope blessing them uh, as they go to defend uh, Christianity uh, in the Middle East. Now he's reaching out as much as he can to other Christian groups within uh, the Catholic system and the related. Uh, and the Russian Orthodox Church has been separated for a millennia. We know four years ago there was a meeting in Cuba between the church and uh, the president, you know, Patriarch Kirill, and that was the first great step when they embraced. Uh, this meeting two weeks ago was to celebrate that fourth anniversary of that meeting and Metropolitan Hilarion, who is the head of external church relations, uh, he was in the Vatican to celebrate this. And the Pope's parting words to him were many greetings to Patriarch Kirill. I hope to meet him soon. The Pope is desperate to have an invitation to go to Russia, to bind the two branches together. That will happen. 
When the image stands upon its feet, it will be united uh, under the control of the papacy. But not only to the Russian Orthodox Church has been reaching out to the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches. We went last year to Romania, uh, and uh, where there are very few Roman Catholics, majority are Orthodox, and he hit it off with the patriarch there. Uh, it's 20 years since Pope John Paul was the first pope to go there. But he is, is working not only uh, in uh, Romania, but also in Bulgaria, to bring back these separated brethren. He wants a unity. He wants to somehow unite the church under his control. And it's not just uh, Christianity. It extends to the Muslims. Back in February of last year, he went to United Arab Emirates, to Abu Dhabi, and there was a big conference, uh, and he represented Christianity there uh, and called for, and it was an interfaith meeting on human fraternity. This is the frog-like spirit coming out of the mouth of the false prophets. And as a result of that conference, the Pope himself has called for a conference in May of this year where he's calling all those in control of education to come to Rome to uh, have this meeting as to how we should look after the needs of the young people who are so afraid of the future with so-called global warming and all the threats that it has and all the difficulties in, in life. And he, he wants to be able to use the church as a channel to educate the young people. And um, once you get the young people on your side, then you've got uh, power in your hand. Fascinating meeting coming up in May. And then more recently, he went to Buddhist Thailand and to Shinto and Buddhist Japan. He's reaching out to all these people. So last year, he visited 11 countries on four continents on the course of seven foreign trips, mainly where Catholicism was a minority religion. This is his aim. Bring back, have a world church. And we know that the image unites so-called Christians and Muslims to come together. We see it happening. A new freedom, this commonweal is a, a, an American um, Catholic journal. A new freedom for Catholic theology is one of the underappreciated contributions of this pontificate. Francis has offered theologians a new opportunity to interpret ecclesial and theological events through which his own pontificate must be understood and evaluated. That is the second... Vatican Council, his, his playing out what, what the Second Vatican Council set in motion 50 years ago, is putting body and flesh to it. Francis, it says, is regarded as the first pope of this new world church, a truly global and non-Eurocentric centric church. Francis may not change the world, but he is reshaping the church, said the New York Times. Well, brothers and sisters, we're living in amazing times. We don't know how long we've got, as uh, Brother Ken explained. For Christ's brothers and sisters, long before go comes down upon the land of Israel, the saints will be called to Sinai to judgment. So we have no idea how soon the Master will come, but we can see it is imminent. And so our appeal to our friends and our young people is don't delay. The time is short. You've got your opportunity to either put your faith in a rock which has stood the test of time. You've seen it come to pass with your own eyes in today's world. Things that were written millennia ago. God is in control. This is a rock and can be a rock in your life. 
And you neither put your trust in that or put your trust in the shifting sands of human thought and human endeavor. And we know where that's going to lead because the Bible's made it clear. That image represents the thinking of men, the kingdoms of men. If we put our trust in that, then we're going to be sorely disappointed because this word will come to pass. The Lord Jesus is going to establish God's kingdom upon this earth. Jerusalem is going to be exalted. The Jews are going to repent and be baptized, as Brother Ken said, in those waters which flow out when the Mount of Olives is split. And there will be peace, and there will be blessing for the whole world. And what the gracious call of the Lord Jesus, that's why he's caused you to hear these things, to give you the opportunity to be with the Lord Jesus in that day, to be on his side, not on the side of those nations that oppose him, but on the side of the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful privilege it is, young people, to be able to know the words of the living God and to have him calling you and me to play a part in that wonderful time of the kingdom when the, when the kingdom is established and all nations accept that Jesus is God's son and God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and the world of nature is not abused by man, but used rightly as God intended, then the earth will be a wonderful blessing, a paradise. Genesis chapter 2 and 3, the Garden of Eden will be the, the whole for the whole world, a wonderful place to live. And we can be not only on the Lord's side, but be given everlasting life. That's something we cannot comprehend. We only know mortality and the aches and the pains and the growing old is not a pleasant thing. But the wonderful gift that God is holding out through the work that the Lord Jesus has done is to be an immortal being like the Lord Jesus is, like the angels have been, to live forever, not in a troubled world, but in a beautiful world. A world that reflects praise to God. Brothers and sisters and young people, we live in such exciting times. Let's grasp with both hands the opportunities that God gives us to put our trust in these things. Now there are so many areas we could have looked at. We could have looked at Israel and all these things, but uh, that is enough. God's hand is working. We can see. Let's have faith that the word of God is living and dynamic, can change our lives. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. God forgives sins. He's looking for honest hearts who will accept what he has said as being true, to trust him. And we can do that. And we will do that. Come quickly, Lord Jesus.